Now it is time for oral questions. And I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, first of all, I want to wish everybody a happy International Women's Day, uh, not only my colleagues here in the House, but also women and girls around the province. And my first question is to the, uh, to the Premier Speaker. Uh, I think like all Ontarians, on Friday I was really excited to hear that we're finally going to get vaccines rolling into our province, and I think that's something absolutely to celebrate, and of course also to celebrate those uh, frontline healthcare workers and pharmacists and family docs that are going to be helping with getting those vaccines into people's arms. I was also pleased that the government finally uh, agreed to put uh, frontline workers in hotspots, our COVID heroes, uh, into the second phase plan for the distribution of the um, vaccine, or rather, to the for the uh, impl implementation of the virus, uh, the vaccine for people uh, in those uh, workplaces and those neighbourhoods. Uh, Speaker, my question for question. the premier is: Does he believe uh, that it's the right thing to do to have people lose pay uh, when they have to go and get their vaccine? Questions for the government. Uh, I recognize the premier to reply. Well, for, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to wish all the women in Ontario uh, happy uh, International Women's Day. We have some of the, the greatest women in the world right here in Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I don't believe uh, that the frontline healthcare workers uh, should should have to, uh, you know, get their pay deducted. That, that's my personal opinion. If they're within the hospital, within the healthcare system, everyone else is lined up, they should be able to get a, a vaccination. And that's that's the answer to the question. The good news is, Mr. Speaker, we're heading up towards a million vaccinations. We have a well-oiled machine. We have the infrastructure set up right across the province. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, all we're waiting for is the vaccines. As soon as we get those, they're going to be into people's arms, and we continue to lead the, the country in vaccinations. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Well, the Premier will know that the Employment Standards Act doesn't cover off uh, people taking time off work uh, without losing pay to get a vaccine. We know that the federal program does not uh, cover off the uh, uh, the potential loss of pay for workers to leave work uh, to get their vaccine. And I think it's really important uh, that we don't put up barriers or, in fact, that we actually take down barriers that prevent people from getting the vaccine, especially as we know AstraZeneca has a very short shelf life. Uh, and so I would ask the Premier, will he agree to making sure people can take time off work to get their vaccine and not lose any pay? Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, as the uh, member opposite knows, uh, we continue to advocate uh, with the federal government improvements to uh, the sick pay program that they have. But I am pleased to uh, announce today in the House that uh, 245,000 workers uh, in Ontario uh, have uh, now uh, applied or are receiving uh, sick pay benefits uh, uh, across uh, Ontario, and we continue to advocate to improve uh, the program uh, for all workers. But I would uh, strongly recommend uh, to people right across this province to continue what you've been doing uh, every single day since COVID-19 hit the province, and that's continue working together to get through this. Uh, it's great news that uh, almost a million more uh, vaccinations are coming uh, to the province uh, this week, and we're going to continue to get uh, needles in arms of people to finally eradicate COVID-19 from the province of Ontario. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, this is something that experts actually agree with as well, that people shouldn't have to worry about losing pay to get vaccinated. In fact, Dr. Michael Warner, Director of Critical Care at Michael Guerin Hospital, says this, and I quote, essential workers aged 60 to 64 toiling in factories and fulfillment centres will not be able to take time off to head to their local or distant pharmacy to get the AstraZeneca vaccine, unless the government provides paid vax time. So the question is, why would the Premier object to something that would make it easy for our frontline heroes in those factories and in those neighbourhoods to get vaccinated? Mr. Labour. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're not uh, objecting to that. Uh, in fact, Mr. Speaker, we continue to uh, work with our federal partners. Obviously, these are clearly uh, unprecedented times with uh, COVID-19 here in the province and across Canada and uh, across the world. But I'm proud to say we've made uh, huge improvements, uh, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to protecting uh, the health and safety of workers, 
uh, their families and the communities uh, at large. In fact, Mr. Speaker, there's now uh, one month of paid sick days for workers here in Ontario and across the country. Uh, 245,000 workers are either receiving uh, sick pay uh, or have applied for sick pay, and there's uh, $700 million uh, left in that bank account, Mr. Speaker. And we're going to continue uh, to work with our federal government, work with uh, all of our partners uh, across the country to ensure that the health and safety of all workers are protected. And I believe Fox? that uh, uh, the majority, overwhelming majority of people are excited to get their vaccinations and will show up to get vaccinations. Thank you. The next question, again, the Leader of the Opposition. Here, my next question is also for the Premier. Um, folks will know that the NDP has actually a bill that we've been trying to get the government to agree to. It was brought forward by the member from London West. Uh, we'll, we've debated it at least a half a dozen times, if not more here. We'll be doing it again today. And in fact, that bill does contain the um, a clause that allows workers to take time off to get vaccinated. But every time we raise it, the Premier shoots it down. So my question is, what's his plan to make sure that workers, frontline heroes, can actually go and get their vaccinations without losing pay? Mr. Labor, Chairman of Skills Development. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of what this government has done to protect the health and safety of every single person uh, in this province. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the very first initiative that this government brought forward, supported by all members uh, of this House, uh, was job protected leave, which told every worker in this province if they're uh, in self isolation, if they're in quarantine, if you're a mom or a dad staying home to look after a son or a daughter because of the disruption in the school system, you can't be fired. Uh, furthermore, we took action to eliminate the need uh, for sick notes. And I'm proud of what this Premier and what this government has done on behalf of workers. Uh, Premier Ford led the charge in Canada to deliver $1.1 billion worth of sick pay uh, for workers. And as I said uh, a moment ago, Mr. Speaker, more than 245,000 workers are now receiving uh, that benefit. The opposition parties Spons? call for two paid sick days. The official opposition said seven, maybe ten. I'm proud to say that we've delivered one month of paid sick days for workers in this province. Supplementary question. Uh, speaker, you know, the government's rollout of the vaccine has been very slow. It's been very confusing. Uh, we know that uh, we've now slipped to eighth when it comes to per capita vaccinations being achieved in the 10 provinces. The variants we know are picking up speed in, in terms of transition or transmission. Rather, We know that AstraZeneca has a shelf life that we have to be concerned about. Uh, and we now know that what we should be doing is everything we possibly can to encourage people to get their vaccines and to take away the barriers to doing so. Why will this Premier not step up and make sure workers, our frontline heroes, can get their vaccine without losing any pay? Mr. Labor. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have been stepping up for workers every single day during this pandemic. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to say that 80 percent of the federal sick day program is directly deposited into workers' bank accounts within three to five days. Mr. Speaker, workers in Ontario can now apply more than once, and we continued uh, to advocate on behalf of workers. And uh, a few weeks ago, the federal government, to their credit, stepped up and delivered uh, 20 days, one month of paid sick days uh, for workers. We're going to continue every single day to stand up for the working class families of this province. We're going to stand with workers every day until COVID-19 is a distant memory. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, we on this side of the House are ready to pass uh, any kind of legislation or motion the government will bring forward to make sure people are able to continue to get paid even if they have to go get a vaccine. That's something we're prepared. It's been a year, Speaker. It's been a year, and this government has not stepped up to protect the livelihoods of our frontline heroes throughout this pandemic. And it's about time that we do the right thing here. I mean, how hard is it to do the right thing by these frontline workers? I would ask the Premier and the government to make it easy for folks, to take the burden off, to make sure people don't have to worry about losing pay when they make their appointment to go get vaccinated. Will the Premier please do the right thing? Mr. Labor. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've been advocating on behalf of workers in their families and every community every single day uh, during this pandemic. In fact, Mr. Speaker, our government has uh, invested uh, more than $45 billion, including 
uh, billions uh, in additional supports for the health care system, supports for individuals, support uh, for businesses. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Premier of this province worked with the Prime Minister, all provincial and territorial leaders, to deliver over a billion dollars in paid sick days uh, for workers. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there's uh, still over $700 million uh, left in that bank account. We're going to continue uh, to work with uh, Minister Qualtro and the federal government to continue advocating on behalf of workers to ensure that all of us working together get through COVID-19. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier, and this is a question about government ethics and accountability. Last Thursday, the government tabled the Supporting Broadband and Infrastructure Expansion Act. Now, normally, you would assume a bill with a name like that focused on expanding broadband. However, on Friday, leaked memos revealed that the true purpose of the legislation was to help casino developers in Durham pave over protected wetlands and avoid a court battle. That's bad enough, Mr. Speaker, but a scan of Elections Ontario's record shows that just days ago, the PC party cashed in nearly $5,000 worth of donations from the project's lead developers. Can the Premier tell Ontarians why his party is taking big donations from developers and then helping them pave over uh, protected wetlands in the province of Ontario. The parliamentary assistant, the member from Milton. What, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. Mr. Speaker, every single MZO issued by the minister on non provincially owned lands has been at the request of the local municipalities. Of course, as we all know, in this particular incident, it was requested by the city of Pickering, it was supported by the region of Durham. Uh, this is an important project, Mr. Speaker, for uh, the region. Uh, Mr. Speaker, to answer the question, in terms of uh, the political donations, uh, I reject the premise of that question altogether, Mr. Speaker. If the member opposite did a little Order. bit more homework on that, Mr. Speaker, she would find out the same developers actually donated thousands of dollars to the members of the opposite in the party, including uh, the former Premier's riding and the current leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Supplementary question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you. Well, perhaps you should reject the donations and you, then you would have some credibility in this House. Speaker, Ontarians aren't surprised by the Premier's relationship with big developers, and that the, especially that it's resulting in a loss of wetlands and natural spaces. But it's wild how brazen he's become while he thinks Ontarians are preoccupied with the pandemic. On February 24th, the developers filled the PC party's coffers with nearly $5,000. Next year, they're going to be able to do donate $10,000. But just eight days later, on March 4th, the minister rushed out of regulation and effectively forces the warehouse to be built on top of a wetland, while also putting in related legislation into a bill that's supposed to be about broadband internet, which is an issue that we all care about. Speaker, does the Premier really think that Ontarians are that gullible, that there's no connection between the donations and what you're designing through legislation for developers, especially when his government bends over backwards to accommodate his big donors? I'm going to have to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. Feuding motive. Government can reply. Member for Milton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, facts are important, and we all we know NDP and the Liberals always seem to be short when it comes to the real facts, Mr. Speaker. As I pointed out, this particular MZO was requested by the City Order. of Pickering. It was supported by the region of Durham. And this is an important project for the region, Mr. Speaker. This project would help create over 10,000 jobs and boost the economy in the region, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the proponent and the TRCA have also entered into an agreement that will ensure the creation of ecological benefit that meets or exceeds any loss to the natural Order. system, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this will lead to a net benefit to the natural environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Kitchener Conestoga. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Right. Speaker, I have had many extraordinary women in my life who have helped shape me into the man I am today. From my mother to my grandmothers to aunts, teachers, and even neighbors, 
women who have played a strong role in my upbringing. And I know that I am not the only one in this House that can say such a thing, Mr. Speaker. And now I have my wife and my daughter to help shape me into being a more loving husband and supportive dad. Each one of us owes a lot to the women in our lives who have been there in the good and the bad times. Speaker, we know that COVID has impacted women at a higher rate than men. And this includes both economically and their social well-being. Speaker, can the Minister of Children and women's issues tell us, tell the House what the government is doing to support women across Ontario, especially during the Order. pandemic. Thank you, Speaker. Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kitchener Condestogo for that great question and also for being a friend and supporter to myself and my caucus colleagues. Speaker, it is true that the pandemic has disproportionately impacted women. Women have been more likely to lose their jobs or leave work to care for kids, and the rates of domestic violence are on the rise. From the very beginning of the pandemic, I've been working hard with sector partners and colleagues to put supports around women. Women's shelters have remained open. Additional funding has been given to help with infection and prevention control. Emergency childcare has been given to frontline workers, and a majority of those being women. Speaker, our government has given wage increases to frontline workers like PSWs and those in the social services sector, with again the majority of them being women. And we are investing into retraining those who have lost their jobs into things like skilled trades, which has, has many incredible opportunities that are well-paying and secure. These are just some of the things that we have done with more so that women will not be left behind during this pandemic and beyond. Supplementary question. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It's reassuring to know that our government is focusing on protecting those who have been impacted the most by the pandemic, and of course, this includes women. Speaker, the Minister mentioned something that I think is important. Many of those on the front lines of this pandemic are women. These are strong, brave women who have been, been on the front lines, front and centre, risking their lives to support us from nurses and doctors to support staff at our local hospitals to police officers and first responders, a heartfelt thank you, Speaker. As I said before, we really owe a lot to the women in our lives, whether directly or indirectly, and what we should be celebrating, we should be celebrating them and thanking them every day, Speaker. It is even more true on International Women's Day. Can the minister please share what we can do to thank all the women in our lives for the incredible work that they do? The Social Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member for that question. Speaker, we celebrate International Women's Day to highlight the success and leadership of women around the world. And the first place I would like to start is right here in the, to the women in this chamber. Each one is a wonderful representative in their riding and their communities and showing strong leadership that women belong everywhere. And while we may disagree on policy or politics, each one of us is working hard to represent our constituents while balancing many other responsibilities. And it is an honour to serve in this House with each and every one of you. Speaker, I also want to take a moment to recognize the nurses, doctors, personal support workers, researchers, childcare and early years workers, and other women on the front line of this pandemic to say a thank you to all of them. We already know how phenomenal women and girls are and the important role that they play in each one of our lives. COVID has only made it clear that Ontario would not operate without the extraordinary women who have stepped in and stepped up to protect our province. That includes our Deputy Premier and Minister of Health, who has done an outstanding job to work hard for this province. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Austria. Thank you very much, and my question is to the Premier. Speaker, Lower, Lower Duffins Creek in the Durham region is an environmental wetland complex that has been classified as provincially significant and is protected by law. Yet, this Premier and his minion, sorry, ministers are pursuing its destruction at all costs. The community cannot understand why this government would prioritize a warehouse sure. that could be built elsewhere over a provincially significant, irreplaceable, environmentally vital wetland. Ontario Nature and Environmental Defence have launched an eco-justice lawsuit against this government, alleging unlawful use of a minister's zoning order, or MZO, allowing for demolition of a part of this protected wetland. Speaker, this government just introduced Bill 257 that would retroactively make lawful what up and until this bill would have been deemed unlawful. My question is, is the Premier planning to rewrite any other laws to wriggle out of any other lawsuits? 
Parliamentary Assistant and Member for Milton. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I pointed out uh, earlier, every single MZO issued by the Minister has been at the request of the local municipality, unless the lands are provincially owned, Mr. Speaker. In this particular case, uh, the request was made by the city. It was supported by the region, Mr. Speaker. This project is important to the region, would create over 10,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, we have a responsibility to support our municipal partners. It's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. The uh, proponent in this case and the TRC have entered into an agreement that will ensure the creation of ecological benefit that meets or exceed any law Loss to the natural system, Mr. Speaker, uh, and will lead to net benefit to the natural environment system. Mr. Speaker, we're also committed to growing the green belt. We've launched the consultation Response. currently, Mr. Speaker. We made a commitment, unlike the Liberals, that carved out the green belt 17 different times, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you again to the Premier. As CBC recently reported, an internal government memo warned that without these Bill 257 Planning Act amendments, there is a, quote, moderately high risk that this MZO would be found to have contravened that law. It also warns that without consultation with impacted Indigenous communities, there is a, quote, high risk that a court would conclude that Ontario has not fulfilled its constitutional consultation obligations, end quote. Wow. This government is going to remarkable lengths to follow through on this warehouse promise. This weekend, hundreds of people in Pickering took a stand for the wetland and against this Premier's anti-environment agenda. The President of the Treasury Board, who is also the Minister of Finance, should be defending this environmental treasure in his community. Folks across the Durham region want to know why this MPP, the Premier and the Minister of Municipal Affairs are doggedly clinging to this particular project. I would love to know who's really making the decisions for the Premier or for the province. My question is this. What will it take for this Premier to leave Duffins Creek alone and stop attacking the environment? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, as I continue to point out, facts are facts. Facts can't be changed, Mr. Speaker. I know the members of the opposite are always, for some reason, short on facts, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned, uh, we made a commitment to protect the Green Belt, and the Minister has been absolutely clear that we will not allow any development into the Green Belt, period. As a matter of fact, we are working on expanding the Green Belt, Mr. Speaker. We've launched the consultations. Unlike the opposition, NDP that supported the Liberals, Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, carved out the Green Belt 17 different times, Mr. Speaker. We believe that is absolutely unacceptable to be able to do that, especially to support their friends, to support Order. the insiders, Mr. Speaker. We will not tolerate that on this side of the House. We will continue to stand up for every single Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Minister, today we'll mark and celebrate the International Women's Day. Like all of our colleagues, I'm astonished and saddened by the spike in domestic partner violence over the last year. I refer you to a February 15th article by the Canadian Press regarding the continued rise in domestic violence. Canada's Assaulted Women Helps Line fielded over 20,000 calls between October 1 and December 31, 2020, compared to 12,000 calls during the same period in 2019. Quote, Everything closed overnight, and our crisis lines lit up, said Yvonne Harding, a manager at the organization. There were limited supports for women beforehand, but at least they had outlets. They had opportunities to leave the house to get help, such as daily trips to and from school, and less access to family and friends are leaving victims with fewer options. Minister, instead of citing dollar figures and statistics as to what the government claims to have done to stop the rise in domestic violence, I'd like to ask if you'd agree with me that ending the lockdown would immediately help many women to be safer at home. The Associate Minister of Women and Children's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. I think it was about a year ago that I visited the shelter in your region with the D'Amico family, and thank you for the contributions that they have made. I'd also like to thank the uh, frontline workers uh, working in women's shelters across Ontario. Thank you to Owaith and Marlene and her uh, workers. They have worked so hard to ensure that women are kept safe at this time, because it's not always safe for everyone to stay home, and women and children who are at risk of violence need to have supports in place. It's a critical time that residential service providers for people experiencing uh, violence have the security that they need to continue supporting vulnerable women. And this year, our government is investing $172 million in supports for survivors and violence prevention initiatives. And this includes investments in emergency shelters, counselling, 24-hour crisis lines, safety planning, and transitional housing. 
And as part of the COVID-19 Action Plan for Vulnerable People, we are also investing $40 million in COVID residential relief funding. And I will have more to uh, answer in the supplementary. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. But my question was if the minister agreed that ending the lockdown would help many women be safer at home. I submit that the answer is unequivocally yes, and therefore continue to implore the government to end the lockdown. Minister, the effects of the lockdown on the economic well-being of women are profound and disproportionate compared to men. Last November, the Royal Bank said that tens of thousands of women already left the workforce. According to Canadian Women's Foundation, women accounted for more than 63 percent of jobs lost since March 2020. But job recovering among men was much better than among women. As of the end of July, women recouped only half of the initial job losses and mostly in part-time work. So I asked the minister to please set aside what the Doug Ford government claims to have done. And on this International Women's Day, would the minister agree Question. that ending the lockdown and fully reopening the economy is the best thing to do for the well-being of Ontario's women? Again, the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member for that question. I agree that women need to be kept safe and have the supports in place. And I also agree that women have been disproportionately affected during this pandemic. And that's why this government is investing $4.6 million in the Women's Economic Security Program and $2.2 million in investing in women's futures programs. These are programs that are made available to provide crucial funding to organizations that support women who are in low-income uh, positions to transfer, um, to develop knowledge, skills, and experience to transition into well-paying jobs. And I thank the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development for the work that he has been doing to encourage women into skilled trades by providing the funds available and necessary to uh, take women who have lost their jobs and give them the opportunities to retrain for jobs of the future, jobs that are sitting empty where we need women to fill those places. So I thank all of my colleagues and thank you to all the women that we have worked with virtual roundtables, hearing firsthand what the needs and concerns of a women in Ontario are. But as we said, keeping women safe and supported is our number one priority. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you again, Speaker. And uh, this time it's to the Minister of Infrastructure. Even before the impacts of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, I've received inquiries from many of my constituents in Kitchener, Conestoga, who are struggling with unreliable broadband service. The pandemic has only amplified the problems of poor, inadequate service. Far too many people in our province lack reliable internet, and in some cases, they have no connectivity at all. I know our government has made historic investments to improve connectivity, and that we understand the importance of this for our small businesses and the many families and students who rely uh, on it to learn and stay connected. Yet despite all the provincial investments and the potential benefits of your legislation, uh, to remove barriers to building broadband faster, there are still some members of this House who claim the province has to do more, that we aren't doing enough, and that there's more work to do. Would you please explain to us exactly Question. what it will take to get adequate broadband across Ontario? Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you uh, to the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for his question and his advocacy for his constituents. And the member is quite right. Our government has done a number of things to help close the digital divide. As the member points out, in the provincial budget presented last fall, we announced historic investments to broadband infrastructure. But as I've pointed out many times before in, to the members of the Legislative Assembly here, broadband is a federally regulated sector. It is the CRTC that is responsible for establishing countrywide rates and standards for internet and cellular connectivity. However, despite this, Ontario is not standing still. Our government is taking steps to close the digital divide, and while we continue to call on our federal government to do its part and properly fund broadband, I would invite all members of this House to join us in that call. Mr. Speaker, we are making historic investments and taking steps to improve and expand broadband connectivity to communities right across Fox? the province, Mr. Speaker, and I'll have more to say in the supplementary. Mm -hmm. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker. And, and Minister, I'd like to read an email I received from Keith, a Conestoga College student from Elmira taking online courses. And I quote, Speaker, Dear MPP Harris, when I finished high school, I never imagined that I would be taking college courses online because of COVID-19. If I had reliable internet, taking my courses would be far less stressful. 
I often have problems participating in my classes because of weak and unreliable connections, and sometimes I have to do my schoolwork late at night or early in the morning to get a better connection. Keith goes on. With my midterms about to start, I'm really concerned that my lousy internet will add unnecessary stress. With more and more people doing things online, when can we expect things to improve for people outside the city when it comes to internet service? And I'd like to thank Keith for that message. So my question again for the Minister of Infrastructure is when might students like Keith have access to reliable high-speed internet? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I'd again like to thank the member opposite for his question. And I want to say to Keith, I understand the difficulties he's experiencing. I live it too, as many of the members of the legislature do. So I understand that more and more people are accessing services online. Students are learning online and families are shopping online, and that's why we have a plan. That's why, for more than a year, our government has taken action to improve internet connectivity for communities in Ontario that lack adequate service. We're making historic investments to improve the internet service in Northern Ontario, Southwestern Ontario, East Ontario, and Central Ontario. And last week, I introduced legislation that, if passed, will help us bridge the digital divide. Because now, more than ever, we need a Made in Ontario plan to help build infrastructure faster, strengthen our communities, and lay the foundation for growth Response. and renewal and long-term economic recovery. We're taking action to remove barriers, and I expect this whole legislature to support this legislation to increase broadband connectivity. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Premier. Speaker, before the pandemic, students in this province were already struggling with overcrowded classrooms and not enough one-on-one -on -one support. And what did this government do? They tried to lay off 10,000 teachers, parents, students, education workers, and us in the opposition stopped the worst of those cuts. But we entered this pandemic playing catch-up, racing to hire the staff needed to keep our kids safe and learning. This pandemic is far from over, but a new Ministry of Education memo is warning that school boards must prepare for staff layoffs for the year ahead. Apparently, the fund aid for COVID has an expiry date. Speaker, why is the Premier looking to make deep cuts to education when our kids need more support than ever? The Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. I want to join uh, the Minister of Children in and uh, women in, in congratulating and acknowledging International Women's Day today. I will note, note Speaker, that there is no government, that there is no premier pre-pandemic and during this pandemic that has invested more in public education than this progressive Conservative Party. Funding is up per pupil, per student. Funding to school boards, over $25 billion, is up. Funding in mental health, more than doubled. That funding envelope is up, Speaker. For special education at historic levels, over $3.1 billion, that funding is up. Funding to prepare students for STEM careers is up in this province. Funding to lift mass scores, over $200 million, that funding envelope is up. To support safe and reliable transportation, funding is up. Funding in the skilled trades and skills development to encourage more into the apprenticeship and careers that we know we need, that funding is up. That funding will continue to remain up under this government because we believe in public education. We believe in lifting up, creating an opportunity society where young people who work hard, who get a good education, get a good job. That Spons? is our mission, and we're going to continue to focus on lifting students up every single day in this province. And the supplementary. Mr. Speaker, perhaps the Minister of Education didn't hear the question. Making class sizes bigger, laying off staff, was always a terrible plan, but today it is an even worse plan. Frankly, it's, it's unconscionable. Children have coped with trauma, with loss, with anxiety over the last year. Our school communities have shown resilience and creativity in the face of absolutely incredible odds, but this pandemic is not over. The disruption is not over. Every single expert in education is saying the same thing. Students and staff are going to need more support than ever. Will the Premier assure anxious parents today that he will invest in the well-being, recovery, and in the future of our students and take these cuts off the table? Again, the Minister of Education goes 
Well, Mr. Speaker, our government is going to continue to invest in public education. I do note the ever-changing position of the member from Davenport. You know, on February 5th, the member said, and I quote, I've been asking where these mystery hires are for months, end quote, and yet today, Today, she purports to believe that these hires were critical. So which one is it? Either they didn't happen for the last six months as you attacked the government, or they did. And the fact is, Speaker, we know 3,400 more teachers were hired on a temporary basis to support lower classroom sizes, 134 Order. more mental health workers, 1,300 more custodians working hard in our schools. The fact is, we know these temporary investments have made a difference to protect students and keep our schools open, a position contrary for the Liberals and New Democrats that would have closed schools for a longer period. We are on the side of parents the one investments going to the front of class we're going to continue to deliver that while ensuring quality education merit-based hiring and a curriculum that leads to good jobs in this province the next question the member for ottawa south Thank you very much mr speaker my questions for the premier speaker personal support workers are a vital part of care here in ontario covid 19 has revealed just how valuable they are speaker the majority of psws are women they have been working tirelessly on the front lines battling this virus, putting themselves at risk and their families at risk, too many times without the proper protective equipment. Speaker, they care for the people we care for most. And I've heard the Premier many times thank PSWs, and I know that they probably appreciate his thanks, but what they need is his commitment. So the temporary wage enhancement is set to expire on March 31st. So, Speaker, through you, can the Premier commit to providing PSWs a permanent wage increase? Minister of Health. Well, they, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. We value the work that personal support workers do um, in all aspects of our health care system, in long-term care, home and community care, hospitals, uh, and we um, Part of our government's plan to deal with COVID-19, we have increased PSW wages, $3 per hour for eligible workers in long-term care, $3 per hour to eligible workers in excuse me, home and community care, $2 an hour for eligible workers in public hospitals, and $3 per hour to eligible workers in social services, providing direct personal support services to people in their community. This is something that we need to do in order to recruit and retain personal support workers. We're examining all aspects of the issues relating to personal support workers, including the amount that they're being paid. There are many other issues. This is something that is under consideration right now by our government, and we will take action as necessary on or before March 31st. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I, I don't believe I got the answer that a PSW is needed to hear today. They need to hear about the government's commitment. They don't want to see another six-week gap between the pandemic pay and then the next iteration. So it's critical that we raise these wages to stabilize the workforce, and it's the right thing to do. And one of the challenges that we have right now is it's becoming destabilized between home care and long-term care. So we know that we need to raise those wages permanently, and we have to pay people a decent living wage. So fewer home care PSWs Order. will mean less care for seniors, which means it will put more pressure on long-term care. It will also not allow them to be where they want to be. So advocates are calling on the government not only to uh, standardize the wages across both sectors, but also to raise the wages of PSWs to $25 an hour in all health care settings. So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier assure this House that his government will standardize PSW wages to $25 an hour. Well, we're certainly well aware of the issues relating to personal support workers who provide a vital role in our health care system. And so uh, the member will also know that the issue isn't simply one of remuneration. That is part of it for sure. But we also know that as we graduate personal support workers in Ontario, almost half of them leave within about a year because in some cases they aren't they don't expect the work that they actually are going to be facing. So we need to do a, take a bunch of actions. One is to make sure that as they're trained, that they have training 
within some of the places of work, in hospitals, in long-term care homes, and in home and community care, so that they can anticipate what the work is going to be. We also need to recognize them as a profession, that this is something that they're sort of the forgotten workers in the health care system, when in actual fact they are the foundation, especially in home care where they're meeting very vulnerable clients. So all of these issues are being taken into consideration right now, along with the issue of remuneration, because we know we need more personal support workers within our health care system. And the next question, again, the member for kitchener conestoga Well, thank you again, Speaker. And uh, this time I rise to ask the government about its position on the Line 5 Energy Corridor following last week's historic vote. This House voted to call upon the federal and provincial governments to fight against the closure of Line 5, while at the same time recognizing the safety of pipelines as a way to transport energy. Mr. Speaker, will the government House Leader please stand and commit that this government will get behind this motion, protect Ontario's jobs, and fight against the closure of Line 5? <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member is, is quite correct. That was a, uh, a very historic vote last week for a number of, uh, a number of reasons. Not only uh, did uh, a vast majority of this House agree that pipelines are, uh, are safe and that important for jobs and economic activity, it, we saw really a, an historic shift finally from the NDP, Mr. Speaker, who for decades have talked against pipelines, have talked against the safety of pipelines. Earlier in the week, I know her, the leader of Her Majesty's uh, op loyal opposition had suggested that this was a debate, the Line 5 debate was something that shouldn't even happen in the province of Ontario. They voted against Line 5 twice, but finally, after the great work of the member for Sarnia Lambton and a number of other members, he was able to convince the NDP that 50 years of NDP ideology on pipeline safety was wrong and that it is responsible for good jobs. It is safe, Mr. Speaker, and we will do all that we can to make sure that we work Order. with the federal government to keep this Line 5 going, Mr. Speaker, as the House has asked us Spons. to do. And I thank the NDP for their support of pipelines and those jobs. Supplementary the government for its strong position on this issue, and I also want to congratulate the NDP for finally agreeing that pipelines are a safe way to transport energy here in the province, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the people of southwestern Ontario who would uh, appreciate it as well if the Liberal members in this House would have also voted to protect jobs and save the Line 5 pipeline. Mr. Speaker, because this is such an important issue, can the government House Leader stand and unequivocally affirm that the government here in the province of Ontario will fight for line five. Sure, sure. The Again, the member is absolutely correct, and I can assure the member uh, and all of those members uh, who voted in favour of Line 5 that we will do just that. We will fight to ensure that that motion is, uh, is brought forward, that our federal friends, our, our friends down south, understand the importance of Line 5. What is shocking, Mr. Speaker, that in his first test of leadership, the leader of the Liberal Party failed the people of the province of Ontario. He failed workers. He failed all of those people that rely on jobs because of Line 5, Mr. Speaker. He has proven that he's not ready for the job. He's not up to the job. This Liberal leader is the same as the other Liberal leader, Mr. Speaker. We will stand up for jobs. We will stand up for pipelines. We will stand up for the billions of dollars of economic activity that, those, uh, that natural resources provide to the people of the province of Ontario. Even if the Liberals won't, Mr. Speaker, we will. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Um, today we celebrate International Women's Day, and I want to wish all our sisters around the world a happy International Women's Day. But, Speaker, while we celebrate, we must also commit to ensuring that we have a gender-based strategy to our economic recovery here in the province of Ontario. For the last year, as Ontario faced the biggest crisis it's ever seen, it's been women who have been on the forefront of the, the, of the crisis. Without the sacrifices of these nurses, teachers, PSWs, and frontline heroes, all mainly women, who knows where we'd be today. But, Speaker, while women were working hard to keep us safe and keep our province moving, this government refused to give PSWs the raise that they promised. They sent teachers back to unsafe classrooms. They stood by while women lost their jobs and their livelihoods and forced to close their businesses. And they keep voting against paid sick days here in Ontario. My question to the Premier, will the government commit today on International Women's Day to ensure that all women will receive the supports that they need in this economic recovery and that they won't be left behind in this crisis as we move forward? 
the Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that question. And happy International Women's Day to all women that are here. In my ministry, we celebrate women every single day. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the many mentors that I've had in my life growing up, such as my mom, who is also a, a politician locally, um, and also the, the work that we need to do uh, to mentor the next generation. I have three young daughters, and I hope that they will work hard to achieve all of their goals. Um, but I think it's also important that we're supported by men. And I look to the, the men in my own caucus who are here to support us, our premier who supports us as women uh, in government. So thank you to each and every one of you. Um, you know, we need to, everybody has a role in achieving gender equality, and that includes men and boys. And we need to continue changing attitudes that prevent women and girls from achieving their full potential. We recognize Response. that women have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic, and women will not be left behind as this province recovers. Speaker, based on this Conservative government's responses this morning on International Women's Day, women are yet again not a priority. We need an intersectional feminist recovery, one that serves the women of St. Paul's and across Ontario during COVID-19 and beyond. Our local PSWs need a $4 an hour permanent pay increase for starters. Our local women small business owners need no evictions. We need funding to keep our businesses alive. We need the funding this government promised us from Metrolinx to market and advertise our small businesses, especially those run by women and BIPOC community members. Our artists, our women artists, deserve direct funding. Our survivors of violence deserve Order. OSAP forgiveness. When is this government going to give women the same priority it gives to PC party donors, developers, and big corporate CEOs? If not on International Women's Day, Speaker, when? When are you going to get it right for women? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for this question. We, in fact, support women each and every single day. This government has stepped up. In fact, as you said, you've, mentioned, you've talked to many workers across the province, as have I, as have all of my members in, the, in Cabinet. And one thing that we hear from women uh, many times is the need for childcare. And I thank my colleague, the Minister of Education, for the work that he has done to ensure that we are providing affordable, accessible and flexible daycare for women and families across this province. In fact, we had committed a billion dollars to build thousands of new childcare spaces in schools over the coming years in addition to the 16,000 spaces created in 2020. We provided Ontario with the CARE tax credit in addition to child care expense deduction and will target tax relief in low and middle income families. This government has stepped up. We are here to support families and women. Thank you to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development for his investments in training women into well-paying jobs that are needed in the future. So this government steps up every single day, not just on International Women's Day. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. Happy International Women's Day to all women. Today I wear green for hope. My question is to the Minister of Health. Minister, Scarborough has been the hardest hit community in Ontario when it comes to COVID-19 in the pandemic. Hospitals in Scarborough have had the highest COVID inpatient numbers, more than any other health unit in the province. For every 100 individuals infected, five end up in ICU in Scarborough. The Ontario COVID-19 science table reports that a vaccine strategy that prioritizes both age and neighbourhood would prevent an additional 3,767 cases, 702 hospital admissions, 145 ICU admissions and 168 deaths from COVID-19 as compared to a strategy that pr prioritizes based on age alone. Equal share of vaccines to all hospitals sounds fair, but it Question. is not when you consider Consider the positivity rates in Scarborough and the infection rates and the ravages of this virus over the last 12 months. Minister, will you prioritize the distribution of vaccines to Scarborough hospitals and clinics today? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. This is a really important issue. We do have a vaccination plan, one plan that is being rolled out by the 34 public health unit regions across the province. The allocations are based on the population in the area, but it's also looking at things like 
uh, at-risk neighbourhoods, at situations where there are a number of homeless shelters, for example. There are additional vaccines that are allocated based on that because we know that there are situations where there are uh, some at-risk neighbourhoods where they have exceptional rates of both COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, and unfortunately deaths. We are taking both age and risk into account in both allocating vaccinations and setting up the clinics. As a matter of fact, I will be visiting a, va a mass vaccination clinic this afternoon with the Premier. Response? In well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that, and I would love to join you on that visit in Scarborough, because that is not what I am hearing from the health providers in Scarborough. We have not seen the number of allocations based on risk, and we know that Scarborough has Order. been the highest hit community compared to anywhere else in terms of the infection rates as well as the hospitalization rates. So therefore, they do require more vials of vaccines. And you know, I can appreciate that other hospitals and areas in the province have extra vials, so they've started to vaccinate those 80 and over in their communities. The Scarborough allocation has not even been enough to do the allocation of phase one. So they need more vaccines for the size of the problem that they have based on infection rates, based on positivity rates, based on death rates. We have the data, we have the science, we have the ethics Question. to make this decision. Will you provide the vaccine so that Scarborough hospitals can do the vaccinations to those over 80 in the community this week? Again, the Minister of Health. We are taking all of those factors into consideration. Every public health unit region across Ontario, all 34 of them, receive vaccines based on population and based on risk, based on at-risk neighbourhoods, based on the uh, number of shelters, homeless people that they have. All of that is being taken into consideration. Scarborough is no different than any other community. What I would say is that some areas with smaller populations are now able to uh, do the inoculations of people over 80 years of age. In some parts of Toronto, that hasn't happened yet because of the number of essential workers that need to be uh, inoculated, the number of people in long-term care homes, and so on. But I can tell you that over the next several weeks, Toronto's Pfizer allocations are going to be quadrupled in addition to 17,000 doses of Moderna this week to plans to increase future allocations to over 7,000 doses in future shipments. I would also point out that according to the COVID-19 science advisory table, due to swift action by our government and in conjunction with our partners, our implementation of the vaccine rollout to the long-term care. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for next question, the member for York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to is for the Premier. My office has been contacted by many family members confused about the first scene rollout, who qualifies, where they go, and how their elderly parents or those with language barriers will be able to access the system. York Southwestern is identified hotspots and one of the high risk that is harm to many essential workers, many of whom are black and racialized residents that were previously neglected by this government when a local COVID testing facility hasn't even established until late September uh, last year, are fearful they are once again being left behind. What can the Premier tell our community about the first scene plan to address residents' concerns, and will our high-risk community have local fascination facilities? Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much to the member for the question. This is an important issue. I know many people are concerned about when they will be receiving their vaccines, and they're anxious about it, and we're anxious that they receive the vaccine as soon as possible. But we are vaccinating it based on age, of course, as the end of uh, phase one, people over 80. As we start moving into phase two, it will be people between 60 and 79 years of age and so on. But it's also based on risk, as I've indicated before. There are some at-risk neighbourhoods within Toronto Toronto that uh, will be receiving additional vaccines. There will be some mobile testing clinics. There will be mass vaccination 
sites as well, but the communications are very important. They have been translated into a number of different languages. That information is available on the website. And in addition, as the uh, local public health units are ready to start vaccinating in different stages of age and risk, that will be notified to the people in those communities in many, many languages. We want everyone who wants a vaccine in Ontario to be able to receive one. And the supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. A recent report, Toronto Star Story, outlined that more than 350 sites for COVID immunization did not include a single location in high risk community like ours in New York Southwestern. I know this government wants to pass things off to local public health, but I urge you to take direct action and leadership and work with Toronto Public Health to leave no one behind and be vigilant when it comes to high-risk communities like ours. I sent the Health Minister and Dr. Devella a letter outlining a list of suggestions like vaccinating entire senior buildings at, what, at one time. Will the government listen to my suggestions that include local access and accommodation for seniors and others who simply cannot physically stand waiting in long lineups and create our fascination uh, facilities in my community. Minister of Health. I, I thank the member very much for his suggestions. I'd be very interested in reviewing them because we want to make sure that everyone who wants a vaccine will be able to get one. We are working with Dr. Devilla. I know that Dr. Williams, our Chief Medical Officer of Health, speaks with Dr. Devilla almost daily. That is really important because we want to make sure that we're going to have access sites for people to receive vaccinations in all parts of the province and in many locations. Some will be mass vaccination clinics, some will be in pharmacies, some will be in primary care providers, some will be even mobile test units for some of the communities at risk. So we are working with Dr. Devilla. We are working to make sure that all of the information is translated into many languages. We don't want language to be a barrier for people to be able to receive access to vaccines. We will uh, take every step that we need to take to ensure that everyone who wants a, vac a vaccine will be able to get one. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Children's and Women's Issues. Mr. Speaker, on International Women's Day, I too want to ensure that we don't miss the opportunity to recognize the disproportionate impact that this pandemic has had on women in particular. And it's worth repeating that 10 times more women than men have fallen out of the labor workforce. Which women were hit hardest? your youth, visible minorities, newcomers, and many moms. 12 times as many mothers as fathers left their jobs to care for toddlers and school-aged children. Most of us likely know at least one woman, if not more, who are part of these alarming statistics. Mr. Speaker, I'm asking this question on behalf of all women of Ontario who are struggling right now to stay afloat and continue to be a pillar in their family. Minister, can you explain how childcare will be made more affordable and accessible, and explain how and when women can have access to the support you have referred to to ensure that they can truly be part of the economic recovery? Associate Minister, Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that great question. And as I said, not a round table goes by from any sector that we talk about childcare and how necessary it is, not just for moms, but also for families. And thank you to the Minister of Education. We participated and heard from numerous women across the province on what we can be doing to ensure that we have affordable, accessible, and flexible childcare. Uh, childcare centres are not always possible for women who are working in agriculture, women who are working in skilled trades. We need to ensure that we have that flexibility when moving forward, which is why this government has the CARE tax credit to ensure that. We've also committed a billion dollars to build thousands of new childcare spaces in Ontario, and as I said, 16,000 uh, spaces created in 2020 alone. So we are working as well with our federal, provincial and territorial counterparts to ensure that we have childcare spaces available for women, because we know it is such an important Response. piece. And I look forward to the supplementary. Thank you. Any supplementary question? Mr. Speaker, having to sustain such economic hardship doesn't come without emotional and mental challenges. And we haven't spoken to that yet, but so many women 
you know, are superwoman and almost expectant to be, but, you know, reality is just we're just human, you know that. Well, some women can benefit from the support of their family, not everyone does. So single moms are struggling and so many who were already in challenging positions before the pandemic don't know where to turn for help. So my question is, what is the government doing to actively offer mental health support to women? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to, again to the member for that question. And I too have heard heartbreaking stories from women in this province about the struggles that they have had during COVID. We know that women have been disproportionately affected because they are overrepresented uh, in areas such as hospitality and tourism, the restaurant business, retail business. So these are you know, all um, issues that we need to take forward and hearing firsthand from those women, but also hearing the solutions as well. And I understand that mental health um, has been a, an issue for, for everybody, for our young people, which were providing supports in post-secondary uh, for mental health, but also for those who have lost their jobs, have lost their business. And I you know, work with the Minister of uh, Mental Health and Addictions and the great work that they are doing on our roadmap to wellness and the Minister of Health as well, to ensure that we're Response. providing uh, mental health supports across the, the lifespan of, uh, of people, ranging from, from young to, uh, to adults and seniors. So thank you for your concerns. The member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. At 12.01 a.m. today, the stay-at-home order was lifted and the mass eviction of tenants has begun again in Toronto. 14,000 Ontarians have already been evicted from their homes during the pandemic. These people have been forced to find emergency shelter, look for apartments, or crash with family and friends in the middle of a pandemic. And many of these people have lost their income, their job, or their business through no fault of their own because of COVID-19. Evictions are very clearly putting people at risk of catching and spreading COVID-19. And with new, more aggressive COVID-19 variants spreading in our community, people must have a safe and secure place to call home at this time. Premier, you said people who can't pay their rent during COVID-19 will not face eviction. So why are you lifting the eviction ban? Jane, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The Attorney General to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the, as the member knows, the Landlord Tenant Board is an adjudicative tribunal that resolves disputes between landlords and tenants, independent of the government. And, and as, the opposite, as the member opposite knows as well, the emergency order was issued um, to protect public health, to help people stay at home and prevent the spread of COVID 19. The enforcement of evictions was temporarily suspended in those areas that were locked down. And now that the lockdown has been lifted, uh, we, normal processes will resume. There are uh, discretion, and, and the sheriff's office has uh, has its own directive. And we will continue to put the safety of individuals at the forefront of everything that we do. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. I beg to inform the House that, pursuant to Standing Order 101C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Ms. Begum assumes ballot item number 63, and Mr. Rakasevic assumes ballot item number 93. We now have a deferred vote on private members' notice of motion number 142, as moved by Mr. Mantha. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I will ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies. <laughs>